Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the final lecture in our Stad Salon series on cities for people, not for profit. And today we're very honored to have Emeritus, not just Professor, but Emeritus Professor Massimo De Angelis from the University of East London. Professor De Angelis is a key voice in the debate about commons, which is the theme of our final lecture. And over the past three decades, he's been researching, writing and teaching about the common social conflict and contemporary capitalism and its many crises. He's also the instigator of the web journal, The Commoner, and he's the author of several extremely interesting books, such as the latest one, Omnia Sunt Comunia, that's not Italian, but Latin, which means everything, or perhaps everybody, is part of the commons, where he brilliantly shows how the commons is more than just the materialities of resources held in common, but also the social systems consisting of the commonwealth, a community of commoners, that is potentially all of us, their interactions and decision-making procedures, and also communal labor. So it's going beyond this materiality of the commons as, as just a space, but thinking about the social systems we built on top of that. Now his obsession is to think, in his own words, that through the question of social change, how we can collectively crack open the current mode of social cooperation, hegemonized by capitalist rationality, and move to a post-capitalist society in which we all can live in dignity, mutual recognition, and social justice. So I think that's ultimately the goal of the economy and perhaps not growth, right? And to construct models of social cooperation that are deeply democratic and respect the biophysical boundaries set by our planet Earth. So that's a bit the general background of his, you could say, quest uh, of over three decades. And in today's talk, on the city as a commons, deep democracy, diffused governance, and social reproduction. Professor De Angelis starts from necessity of social reproduction to start developing a framework to govern the city as a commons, installing degrowth, but also improving living standards and reducing ecological impacts. I'm extremely excited about this final talk. I hope you're also very excited about this. Uh, there will be plenty of time for questions at the end and perhaps even some interaction throughout. So please give him a very warm welcome. Thank you. Many thanks. Um, and many thanks for this invitation in this uh, beautiful setting. And um, I, I, my, one of my aims uh, this evening is to turn you into guinea pigs. <laughs> in the sense that uh, I'm, uh, uh, the presentation I'm, I'm making today is uh, is the result of some research I've been doing in the last uh, couple of years, uh, which resulted in a paper, uh, in a chapter being published recently in a nice collection called Post-Growth Planning. Uh, and guinea pigs because the ideas I am uh, uh, try to expose tonight are complex, they were difficult for me um, it has not been easy for me to study uh, the works of, uh, for example, cyberneticians, uh, which uh, uh, I think give us lots of insights into the question of, of social change and uh, making now of a new world. Uh, and it, it is a question of uh, understanding how a complex reality, such as a city, can, can be conceived and uh, self-organize itself as a commons. That is, a, a, a social system where the people who are part of it and who live and reproduce their life there and relate to one another in different forms and relate to their no human natural environment. Uh, that is, the inhabitants of it uh, can also become those who govern the city, and which is the basic idea of the commons. We generally think about the commons as a smaller 
systems, uh, not very high complex ones. So the challenge uh, that I'm trying to uh, pursue is how can we do that? And I, I, I will not provide answers to that specific answer, no, far from my um, uh, for my not desire, I would love to, but it's too complex. It needs a collective engagement. Um, and I don't want to provide the utopian imaginaries, as we generally are accustomed to, nor slip into kind of simple technicalities, or, or at this stage uh, draw from classical ideas of decentralizations, which are useful uh, to be uh, uh, engaging with, but not now. Uh, but what I want to problematize also with the help of uh, uh, various uh, um, uh, disciplines, including systems theory, complexity, and, uh, and cybernetics, is uh, how the ultimate rules of uh, complex social organization can help us to understand two things. And the first one, um, is uh, today is that today we have a great uh, need for grassroots democracy. It's not uh, simply a question of uh, of an ideological or value-oriented stance, but I believe that by reading some of the insights of of this literature, uh, we actually discover that we need it to deal with the major crisis of our time and to make sure that the solutions to these crises, uh, environmental, social justice, etc., are actually sustained in time. And second, to understand broadly in uh, which uh, large uh, functional areas this democracy should be organized, this deep democracy, let's call it deep democracy, to, uh, to make a distinction between what we are seeking to the democratic forms. Uh, we now, and, and, and how, how this democracy can sustain without the need to resort to hierarchies of income, wealth, status, or power, or at least to substantially reduce these um, this these hierarchies. So you see, the, the project here is, of course, uh, <laughs> can be said very utopian, but I say, no, I think we have to engage with this. The world in which we, we are at, uh, we are we living in, and we reproduce through our economies, and, and, and uh, is, is a world that reproduces the problem it, it generates, and, uh, and to fight against this problems and to fight against social and environmental injustice, in, injustice requires us to try to think through different ways. Now, in, in the operation, I, um, I, I was helped by the work of uh, uh, Stafford Beer. Stafford Beer uh, was work in the 70s and, and 80s, and I'll discuss some of his work, has become a, a classic of uh, organization cybernetics, what is generally called organization cybernetics. But I if we read his work uh, today with a an attentive mind and hearts uh, open to the contemporary sensitivities that emerge from environmental movements and social justice uh, movements uh, of the presence, and uh, if applied to much wider areas of the com economy and focus on the question of uh, uh, social uh, and, and environmental reproduction, I believe that it uh, allow us to, uh, to affirm that yes, uh, not only uh, we can uh, organize a complex entity like a city in terms of, common, uh, of commons, but uh, uh, also that is, uh, it is possible 
to do it, and we must and we can, essentially. So I hope this uh, will add what I'm saying today, which uh, is, uh, 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 which are some series of complex idea that I'm trying to explicate as simply as possible. And I invite you to please really be as engaging as possible and even stop me if some passages are not clear. Maybe it's not even clear to me and that I would like to find out through your, uh, you know, <laughs> questions. Uh, uh, but yes, I mean, uh, let's leave the debate in the end, but if there is any clarifications or please... Uh, uh, come out. I don't want to make the the big lecture here where I, I want an, uh, hopefully a, some type of engagement because that will also help me and help us all to think through these problems. So I'm, I'm saying this really with much uh, um, humbleness. Um, and humbleness, in fact, which we should all have, uh, when we seek to go beyond the ideological contrapositions and trying to um, uh, give a contribution to sorting out our world in a big mess. Okay, having said that, let me start then from the actual beginning, the city as a common. Now, to, to posit the city as a commons imply uh, three main things. The idea that its inhabitant can govern it, the idea of a form of government which is deep and diffused and centered, and the idea that uh, uh, they govern the city with one main purpose in mind, although these main purposes include many other sub-purposes, of course, because reality is complex. But the one main purpose in mind is that they, they govern it for social and ecological reproduction. Not for profit, not for economic growth, not for accumulation, but for social and ecological um, reproduction. And a common is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, the very basic idea of the commons uh, is, is, is as, as a social system. That's what I discussed in, in my last book, Omnia Sunt Comunia. Um, it's a social system made of elements, uh, a commonwealth that is resources uh, which are part of a common pool, a plurality of commoners, of members of whatever communities, uh, and, uh, and of uh, uh, a commoning, that is an activity uh, which is a form of social labor, uh, but it's a form of social labor which, uh, uh, in which the uh, laborers themselves engage in, in, the, in what I call the measure of things. The measure of things is this list of questions. The what, the how, the when, the how much, the where, the who produces, right? Is what, whenever you produce something, some answer to those questions are given in companies that are given hierarchically, in a hierarchy, the what, the where, the how, etc. In a commons, they are produced horizontally. The measure of things that matter are the measure of things of our own uh, life uh, uh, activity. So the question is how, from at least such a simple definition of commons that I've explored in my Omnia Sum Communia, we can develop a, 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 an understanding of a more complex entity, and it's an open question. My discussion uh, includes different aspects which I have to introduce so as we are on the same pace. Uh, the other question is what the end of governance should be. Okay? Well, um, uh, I think that the main uh, aim of, uh, of governance uh, should be designed, uh, precise governance should be designed in our complex city as common with one purpose in mind, as I mentioned, 
that is to address the various, very grave, multiple crises of our time, um, and at the same time to produce a, a context in which there is good life for all. Okay, and uh, I think that is uh, the the overall social o objective. I I'm not going to argue this now. I take it for granted. We can discuss it later. But I I, I think there are good argument to say that this the implies uh, the accumulation of capitalist social relations, what is generally called in the literature as degrowth, okay, which is generally referred to as a reduction in the GMP, is also means a deaccumulation of social relations which produces that economic uh, growth. Um, so where do we have to start in terms of the aims of governance? Well, is what we generally call social reproduction. Um, uh, social reproduction, it will become clear because I will define it later, is, uh, is, uh, is a general field of social cooperation within which uh, uh, subjectivities uh, can be situated, recomposed, uh, rep they reproduce in their life in multiple forms, um, and they are pres present in different contexts. But we will deal with this w in, 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 in later on. Uh, there is an hypothesis in mind, which I, again, I don't discuss, but we can discuss it later. Uh, and the hypothesis uh, is uh, um, that uh, uh, social transformation uh, to address these issues um, uh, must uh, rely on uh, um, subtracting our participation finding the ways, finding the collective ways to subtract our participation into the circuit of capitalist production. But of course, this is, cannot be based simply on a voluntaristic basis. I cannot simply say, OK, tomorrow I'll not look for a job anymore, uh, anymore because I depend on a job. right? But so this has to be a collective political process. Uh, but the, the, the question is, that we have to reduce our dependency on capitalist market and those forms of uh, correspondent forms of uh, uh, production, and uh, at the same time create new forms of, of social production, which also create new subjectivities, new people. Not that we start from a, a the, the model of what a new person should be or a new subject should be. But obviously, since uh, we each and one of us is affected by the interaction in our own environment, in, a, in an environment like a commons where decisions are taken together, responsibility are shared, and, uh, and, and mutual engagement is valued in a horizontal way rather than a vertical way, we also uh, are developing new skills and new sensitivities uh, which produces us as new subjects. So the production of subjectivities and the production of the systems within which we operate goes hand in hand. It's, it's like what is born first, the egg or the chicken. Well, the two things go together. Okay? So that's another thing I want to say before going to the thing. And then, sorry for the messy thing, but I just wanted to <laughs> to uh, focus only. Maybe I'll I'll go. How long is this? I can be a rock star. Oh, oh, oh! Now I can play really. Uh, here it is. It works. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, it's even better like this. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, this, I, 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 the reason why I put that thing there is try to uh, capture in a nutshell what's, uh, where, where are we located, uh, uh, our little lives, little circuits of productions in, in a general scheme of things. Um, uh, now, uh, of course, the largest... Uh, 
uh, circle here is the ecosystem. We are all embedded within it, within Gaia. No? The, the, that's obvious. And, and, uh, and, the, uh, and embedded within uh, uh, the, 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 the Gaia or the ecosystem is s s what is generally called in the literature societal reproduction. Uh, the production of society as a whole, which includes its own complexities, and you can imagine all the different dimension of it. Okay, but the, the the relation between the overall production of society in relation to the ecosystem is what's generally called social metabolism. Okay, that Marx actually talked about it, and many others. Uh, is 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 how we relate to non-human nature. And, and it goes back to us. And, uh, and within the societal reproduction, we have, I think, it's important to identify two main s broad spheres, which are very messy. It's not, you cannot just go out and, now here, you, know, you can identify both of them right here or in any other uh, shops around. And, but there are two broad spheres in terms of their objectives in terms of their way to organize social cooperation. And one is capital reproduction and one is social reproduction. Okay? Capital reproduction is the reproduction of capital. Uh, Aristotle uh, called that uh, money that is buying things for what purpose? You know, Aristotle liked final causes. He was asking the key question that scientists today don't dare to ask, which is, what's the purpose of something? And the purpose of something in, 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 in capital reproduction is to make more money, okay? Money in order to make more money, okay? Which is, uh, which, which reproduces a systemic loop, and we could discuss that, uh, and, and, and bring everything in it. Uh, and then there is social reproduction. Social reproduction is, is a different thing. Uh, social reproduction is to produce the needs and, uh, and desires and, 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 and the, the fabric of society, uh, of, of people within it. And, uh, and, uh, um, and, uh, and, and with, with respect to the overall and recognition of the overall uh, ecosystem that we are embedded in. So the key thing is that these two principles are clashing. Clashing, why clashing? Well, one of the reasons why they're clashing is that this capitalist reproduction is potentially boundless. Its own motives take, take it to the point that in order to survive, it needs to expand as a system. And the expansion in the last uh, 300 years has reached a point that threatened all of us, right? With both environmentally and, and socially, okay? So it's reached a point in which there is no more space to, 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 to uh, expand. We, this is where we are at, okay? Uh, in bracket, I was reading today on The Guardian about uh, the planned investment of fossil fuel companies. Planned investment today. If you take the planned investment today of fossil fuel companies, and those are Russian and American, incidentally. So it's, it's not good or bad, okay? Russian and American and... And, uh, and of course, uh, Arabs, Italians, and whoever, whatever other <laughs> countries of origins these fossil fuel companies have. And if you take the plan um, investment today, and if you calculate how much of new investment, not just the investment to maintain the current production of fossil fuel, but the new investment in order to extract more fossil fuel from the ground, well, what, you, what we are having is uh, that uh, um, if you translate that new investment in terms of uh, CO2 emissions and CO2 emissions in terms of uh, rising temperature, we only out of their plan today, we are reaching almost 
three degree more, an increase in three degree more in, in global temperature. Okay, so uh, there is no way we, we, we can accept something like this. No, it's not <laughs> livable. <laughs> Sorry. Now you know that the, the target is what is 1.5, which is almost there already. Uh, so we're talking about 3%, and, and the casualties the, the, of, of, of that type of change, erratic climate uh, that or comes out from almost 3% increase, the casualties in terms of uh, 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 dispossessions, in terms of uh, 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 famine, you name it, raising sea levels, whatever, are far more than any imaginable war at the moment, or any real war at the moment. So we are talking about uh, a declaration of war, in a sense, on, on, on humanity. And that exists out of the plan investment. So this gro growth is threatening social reproduction, including also environmental reproduction, okay? Now, I think both capital reproduction and social reproduction are based, I'm not going to talk about that table to analytical, we're going to carry on, uh, but I think it's important to say that these two forms are, uh, are, are, are as, as I put it over there, Capital reproduction plus social reproduction is a human activity and circuits and systems involving capital reproduction plus in those in social reproduction make up of what you generally call social cooperation as a whole. So whenever you, you hear me later talking about social cooperation, we are meaning a very complex things which include both capitalist, capitalist uh, reproduction, reproduction of the system, and, and uh, the social reproduction. But both of them are actually, um, are actually uh, use different principles of organization. And these principles of organization are simplified very simply three. Capitalist principle, we are there for the money. Statist principle, we organize things things in a hierarchy, and communist principle, we share and make decisions together, or to uh, cite an old, uh, uh, an old quote, from each according to their ability to each according to their needs, in what happens in a, in a, in a community. Okay. Now, these three principles are actually in every form of social cooperation. Right? But of course, they what mo what changes is their relative hierarchy. Now, the problem for us today at the greater scale of social cooperation as a whole is the fact that the capitalist principle is the most important the way we organize our policies, uh, the way we organize our uh, health sector, and the, in, you know, the obsession with a uh, particular set of results, the obsession with economic growth. You know? So we can say that today's social cooperation is called capitalism. Why? For a good reason. Not because everything is capitalist, but because there is a hegemony or hegemony of capitalist principle over all the other principles, okay? That's hegemony, I think, need to be turned upside down, okay? And that hegemony need to give space to a different type of hegemony, in my own particular view, the communist, pr communist principle should have hegemony, but that's something we can debate. So, is that, ma does that make sense? Yes? No? Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Okay. Right, now, social reproduction, uh, as uh, we saw before, is uh, one, uh, uh, one uh, 
Uh, well, I actually already talked about it, so I don't need these slides. So let's say we save some time. <laughs> now, <laughs> now let's uh, let's go more in details because I think remember we are discussing this social reproduction because we are saying this is this is what the aim of governance of a complex entity like the city should be. So let's inquire a little bit more on social reproduction. Okay, we all know what capitalist reproduction is, business is business, making money, okay, fine. Now let's talk about what is social reproduction, okay? And uh, here I mean the sphere of social cooperation that, that has a bodily, cognitive, affective, emotional and relational preoccupation with the production of human beings by means of human beings. The production, the question of production of human beings by, by means of human beings come from Foucault, before that was, was mentioned by Marx, but was not much developed, but that's what it is, okay? Producing human beings by means of human beings. You think about <laughs> a relation uh, between uh, mother and child, uh, just a very stereotypical one, or a nurse in a, in a hospital, or a teacher in a, in a classroom. Uh, it's, it's production of human beings by means of human beings. And ultimately, I think we could make a, an argument that in fact, if you think about it, even producing beer, I pointed a beer, but actually there is a glass of water there, so I will, <laughs> I will get the beer later. Uh, uh, even producing beer or any hard stuff involved production of human beings by means of human beings, ultimately, although it's mediated by a lot of other things, okay? Ultimately, but we'll, we won't get there. Uh, the, the point is that is production of human beings by means of human beings. And we'll go back to that and the relevance of, of, that, of that definition. Now, the let's focus one second on the word reproduction rather than production. Okay? Now, reproduction uh, means bringing forth. That is, producing something, that's the dictionary definition, back to the original place again a new, once more, and that is the re of reproduction, okay? Uh, once more, it gives us a sense of circularity. It's not like production, it starts from input, goes to a throughput, and then goes to an output. But that output goes back to the input, or returns as an input. In other words, we, when, we, when we talk about reproduction, we talk about a loop, okay? And, and through loop, we sustain ourselves and life and etc. Okay? That loop is important to think through. Okay? So, thinking about reproduction does two things. First, it forces us to go beyond instrumental reason. And the instrumental reason, which is at the basis of... Uh, of our culture, really, since uh, since uh, the Enlightenment, I suppose, and uh, but it's also uh, offer us, uh, as Hart and Negri um, said, a radical circularity. Why is radical? Uh, radical in two in two sense. In the first, because um, it, 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 it forces us to somehow think in terms of radical design of social cooperation in such a way to force, to think through the coincidence between means and ends. Because if human beings are, if reproduction means human, the production of human beings by means of human beings, in all the examples I made before, Nurse, patient. Someone acts as a mean, and the other one acts as an end. But actually, also the nurse need to be reproduced. 
So his or her condition of work are very important. His or her condition of life is very important. And the same thing for all the other in these particular relations. So when we're talking about social justice, we shouldn't think instrumentally. We should think about the converge to create systems in which means and ends are somehow flow together, are both uh, taken into account. And so designing those uh, forms of social cooperation which means and ends are all together is crucial. If you go into any corporate uh, entity, you know, they tell you that the most important things are the customers. Uh, what about the workers? Of course, the customers are very important, but what about the workers? Right? Means and end. Right? Corporate mentality would regard the customer are far more important than the workers. You see the the point? Yes? No? No? Okay. Cool. <laughs> All right. So and, and the other aspect, the other implication of this definition is that it opens a space of uh, collective reflection on what are the socially just forms of social cooperation. Forms that I cannot, nobody here can tell you these are the what is socially just. But be precisely because we are faced with uh, multiplicity, a complex reality, and a multitude of subjectivities in different positionalities, this process of radical design and collective reflection should be a common process, what I call co cognitive commoning. The doing in common in a cognitive way so as to bring about diversity together. Okay? Now, here I need to mention, just for uh, clarity, that uh, uh, social reproduction today, today in our cities, societies, however the scale you want to uh, see, is uh, is quite complex. It's made of many of many uh, uh, sites. Uh, first of all, it's made of wage and unwage activities, which uh, which feminists told us families from the 1970s told us are important to create what is generally called labor power, our capacity to work, our capacity to be engaged with others in a productive, in a very general sense, in a very general sense, okay? Wage and unwaged, so there is already disparity there. If uh, the health service cut services into care, for, let's say, post-surgical operation, that means that some unwaged worker at home will have to carry out the burden for that. Okay? So a lot of cost shifting following cuttings in, 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 so in expenditure comes at the expense of unwaged workers. When we had COVID, the first wave of COVID, and there was a surge of mutual aid and solidarity to fill on the crack of uh, uh, health system and, and generally support sy systems to deal with a lot of critical situations like, for example, bringing shopping home to old people or, or, or help commuting uh, of, of the nurses. So there is a huge catalog of activities that people took voluntarily in order to uh, fill the cracks of the system, okay? Well, those were unwaged situations, okay? So there was a lot of unwaged reproduction work there, okay? But there is also waged work in reproduction. I mean, nurses are waged. In Northern Europe, who perhaps their wages, le wage level are far better than Southern Europe. You, in Italy, there are polling uh, wages for nurses. Uh, um, so why? Because a lot of our social reproduction, a lot of uh, the creation of human beings by means of human beings, is 
is based is uh, uh, is is it takes now f big large institutional forms and it should be like that in the sense that uh, uh, there is a pool of knowledge and 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 and, and expertise and technologies uh, which is important okay uh, now in a world uh, hegemonized by capital uh, this labor power, the reproduction of labor power, has to uh, take the character of a commodity because you need to sell it. But we actually reproduce labor power also for other reasons, to, be, to get involved, our capacity to labor, to get involved in a lot of uh, social cooperation networks which are, which are, for example, unwaged. And so the skills and capacities that we develop uh, are... Um, uh, are exceed what is necessary to go on the job market, you know, and that is important to maintain. And a lot of those capacities, at least in my experience, have been developed precisely outside either education or uh, formal jobs. In the in the seventies, uh, where I grew up as a teenager in high school, a lot of things that, that I've learned so many things by not going to school, not that I chose myself not to go to school, but because we had a strike every two days in the school in the 70s in Italy, and we had an occupation. So, but those, <laughs> but, but that time uh, was very, in retrospect, was an amazingly, uh, amazingly productive. Productive because we created, uh, we did many mistakes, of course, but we created uh, 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 according to our desires and instinct and uh, and and we build knowledge we i read far more off school than in school in order to keep up with the problems that we had to face okay so that was recreating our labor power but outside the needs of the job and 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 and, and through capacities that developed in different ways okay so I suppose now we, uh, a couple of other slides on this aspect. Now, we are talking about the governance of the city as, as a commons, so what do we mean by governance? And here, I want to make a distinction, because in the literature, generally, there is this uh, governance proper, which I'm not going to talk about. And the governance proper is, you know, you hear a lot of it, it's like a, a network of different stakeholders in which uh, uh, specific issues are resolved. So th there, is a, uh, there is, I don't know, a oil company need to greenwash uh, its face, uh, its uh, um, uh, formal presentation. Well, you just develop a nice network of stakeholders, including some uh, group in the civil society, some academics, some uh, other business uh, uh, leaders, and you come up with uh, a new image of it, okay? That's not the governance I'm, go I'm talking about. I'm talking about governance in terms of, uh, uh, Foucault mentioned this, as uh, uh, um, Mi uh, Michel Foucault, uh, as uh, uh, the management of flows. Imagine, imagine, imagine a ship. Okay, you know, uh, carried with by wind, so it's, 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 it's an old ship. And, and what you need to, what the, uh, what you need to do is to stir things according to the the wind and environment in a one direction or another direction. Okay, you you know where you want to go, but you're not in control of the environment, right? And so you keep stirring and stirring and stirring, you know, in such a way to manage your ship going toward more or less that direction you want to. That's what a governance is. Of course, it's a governance now which I understood more collectively. But I want to say that there is what, what I, we can call emergent messy governance. It is our world, our social cooperation, our uh, complex world uh, has a form of governance, which is plural. Remember, we, ha we have statist principles, capitalist principles, and communist uh, principles 
organize in different aspects of our lives in different spheres, okay? The overall thing is what we call emergent messy government, governance. That is, at each node of social cooperation, from our families to our schools to the factories to the, uh, a city to uh, a, 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 a nation, you know, there are different nodes of governance, okay? The sum total of it is what is emergent messy governance. Messy because it's diverse. There are different forms of governance we do every time. You do it in your own in daily life. You wake up in a, warm, a moment. You, you deal with whatever comes to, to you in different ways. You, you know that you have a schedule and all that. Uh, and you govern your life uh, as you do it within your family or your network or, or friends or whatever. Now, so the entirety of the city actual governance in all its divergent and conflictive forms and through different nodes of social uh, cooperation, okay? Uh, so it, I think the I, I, li I like the last thing here. A picture, emerging messy governance is the picture of the total number of self-reflective processes, a composite intelligence that emerges out of the different forms of rationality and social rulemaking. You think about it's difficult to think about the complexity of things, but think about the overall thing. Well, that overall thing is made of, what it, what it is, is like a collective brain in action. A collective brain in action. A general intellect, so, so to say. But a general intellect that is internally contradictory. And the main contradiction to me is precisely that contradiction between social and capitalist reproduction, among many other contradictions. But that's what it is, okay? So what is emergent messy governance tell us is that the crisis of social reproduction that we, are, we know about, environmental crisis, social crisis, poverty, the variation of income and wealth, which is escalating through this latest COVID crisis and the effect of the war in Ukraine and the geopolitical implications of it. Uh, the fact that this emergent messy governance tell us that this crisis of social reproduction point at a failure in this governance, that we cannot govern our lives. And if we cannot govern our life, there must be a reason. And I think that the reason has to do precisely with how our social cooperation is organized. The fact that there is an hegemony of capitalist principles in that social cooperation. Because there is an hegemony, an hegemony of that, then we have this crisis of social reproduction. Then we have a failure of this emergent messy governance. So we have to kind of reset the balance between it, and that's why it's important to talk about commons. Okay, we are getting toward the actual um, point of the paper. Uh, very briefly, there is a, um, what we, our task is to govern complexity, okay? The city has a complex system made of many subsystems. Complexity is essentially, uh, as a complex system, is a system which is made of different components or different subsystems, which themselves are subsystems and interact to each other in a variety of ways, often unpredictable. Um, so the property of complex adaptive systems, systems that ha adapt or tr seek to adapt to their own environment, whenever we're talking about system, it's important to think, to, th to think it in relation to an environment, okay? And we can talk about this later on. But whenever we're talking about complex adaptive system, we are talking about two main things. First, there is some degree of self-organization 
of the components of this system that adapt to the environment, and there is emergence. The emergence means that the whole is more or different than the sum of its parts, that we cannot predict linearly what comes from aggregating different elements relating to one another. Okay? So just to make clear, I just spell it out there so as we know what you're talking about here. And now I introduce the first cybernetic idea. For some reason, I think I'm using different slides than the one I sent you, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> I don't know why, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, in fact, no, because I made sure that I actually summarized there is big chunks here, which I say, well, I didn't do these big chunks. So uh, these are the early notes doesn't matter. Uh, so a, a, a property of a complex, si complex system is what is generally called variety. Variety, think it in terms, very intuitively, in terms of diversity, in terms of, um, yeah, in terms of diversity. And uh, what uh, every system uh, tell, tell us, is that, and that was a learning curve for me, is I've used this in engineers here. Oh, here is, you have, you know better than me what is all, what is all about then. Uh, <laughs> now, if you, take a, if you take a system, any system, okay, it can be uh, portrayed as uh, uh, made of two parts. Uh, one is the actual operation of these systems, what the system does, actually. Okay, what's the purpose of it? What, what, it, what, what it does? And then there is some form of management of this system, some cognitive element that says, okay, you have to do it this way, you have to respond in that way. So the actual system is this one, is made of these two components. Okay? And, and, and the system is always linked to an environment. Now, what uh, Ashby Law tells us, uh, Ashby Law is a law in cybernetic, it tells us that generally, the well, one of the things it tells us is that generally the variety of the environment, the diversity of elements, of processes, of, uh, of, of things, in the environment of any specific system, take a city as a system, the environment of Bruxelles, Belgium, Europe, world, uh, the diversity that exists over there is far greater than the environment that exists in, uh, inside Bruxelles, in the oper daily operation that goes around in Bruxelles. All right? Does that make sense? And in turn, the variety of the management, in quote, of that system is less than the variety of that system. In other words, if you take a company, its, uh, it's board of director, collective intelligence, is less than the collective intelligence of all the workers of that company, and the collective intelligence of all the workers in that company is far less than the collective intelligence of the environment of that company, to put it in a different way. That makes sense, right? So how does, uh, how does um, a, 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 a system, through its management, address the question, the diversity of variety between uh, the system and environment by, col by applying filters and amplifiers. And that's why we have that looks like uh, 
electronic circuits there. Okay? Uh, it amplifies select out it, it amplifies certain things that management want to portray to the to the operation and the operations to the world. Think about advertising for a company, for example. Okay? Or uh, uh, in Italy, in the last uh, two months, uh, you cannot talk about peace. Uh, or if you talk about it, you, you, are, you are pointed out because otherwise you speak, you, are, you become a pro-Putin. Okay, that's an amplification of a particular perspective. On the other hand, you filter out elements from the environment to process, and you select some of the elements that you are interested in to processing. And in this way, you try to rebalance the link that exists between the variety of the system and the variety of environment. And in this way, you can, you can survive or, or hope to survive within that environment. The, the, the greater so variety is a property of complex system. Uh, there is a relation between variety and complexity, OK? The greater the quantity of variety of elements within the system, the greater its complexity. So a much diverse cities, or a match uh, uh, with lots of stratifications is far more diverse to deal with and more complex. Uh, and if there are, if there are um, if 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 in this complex entity system there are problems, what we generally call problems of crisis, is because there is a mismatch between the variety of the regulator and the regulated, and the mismatch is addressed through Ash below, um, which argues that in order for regulation to be viable, that is go what we call governance here it is necessary for the regulator to possess the same degree of variety as the, si as the, as, as the complex system it wants to regulate. Now, this is key to understand. Now, this law has been applied in, uh, in, in, uh, by Stafford Beer, we'll see, in order to understand a different sense how a corporation can be uh, can be regulated. It has been in the in the business literature. It is being applied, but always in a moderate way, in order to reduce, perhaps, to make more participation, increasing participations of of staff and workers to making decisions, but within the limits of the corporate world. Here, I want to to, to use this law, Ash below, to really think in a to a radical redesign of our world. Okay, so not to set limits, uh, and, and 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 so the question is how, and partially we saw it already, so uh, we don't need to go th through. Um, but it's, it is the one we were talking about. Uh, so the question is that in order to deal with the diversity of the problems that one may face a repertoire of responses with at least an equivalent level of nuance as those problems is essential. That's the key insight of Ash Law. In order to deal with the problems, that's the red bit there, in order to deal with the problems that we are facing, and you can think it in different scales, environmental, social, etc., those who want to address the problem, that is the regulators or the governance people, the people who deal with the government of things, or the system to be regulated, have to have the same degree of nuances, of facets, of faces, of aspects of those problems itself, themselves. So, in principle, that means that we should all govern, or as uh, Seattle James reminded us, every uh, we want a place where every cook can govern, everybody can govern. Why? Because we embed collectively the complexity of the problems. 
we all know the different nuances that those problems has for us. And if you are engaging with one another in particular ways, in communication, in dialogue, in language, as Umberto Maturana, the great biologist, told us, uh, there, there is a way to socialize those perspectives and finding solutions. The big question is, how? How? And that is the big question. So, so far, we can use this analysis to focus on what we have to do. The difficult bit is how, and that's the challenging bit, very challenging bit, which I'm not pretending to uh, resolve tonight, <laughs> because this is not, but again, certain literature in the, uh, in, in, in the cybernetic literature, in, uh, in cybernetics, can give us some insights. So, but what we know is this. So let's summarize the entire thing, w so far, okay? We've seen that the, the uh, 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 governance as a whole of complex world cities is failed, the, the failure of uh, uh, emergent messy governance, and the law of requisite variety of uh, the Ashby law, it's also called raw requi law of requisite variety, tell us that this is the result of ins insufficient part insufficient variety on the part of the regulator. The regulator existing now to govern our world, are not just those in government, but those in corporations, those, uh, now, you take them all, there is insufficient variety. We are regulating it in such a way that we do not match the variety of the problems. Okay? So, that means that in our cities, nations, etc., there's repertoire of responses is limited by the power structure and hegemony of status and markets-oriented responses. The responses to the problems that are provided by our governments and or, 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 or the lobbies, of, or uh, corporate lobbies, are inadequate to deal with those problems. In fact, and we can argue this, are reproduced through those responses. Okay? So, the existing power structure and hegemony, and hegemony stifles the variety of possible choices and solutions as a function of private interested, interest and consolidated power structures. That we know. The solution, very simple. Increase the variety of responses to our social ecological crisis. How? Increase the variety of regulators through democracy. Deep finding forms of deep, dis diffuse, and decentralized democracy, or called in the literature also polycentric governance systems, polycentric but very diffuse and spread, multiplied governance system articulated through one. Distributed control governance. We need uh, some sort of distributed control governance with a highly autonomous network of local actors pursuing specific form of social reproduction. And this would mean to developing from already self-organized situations like what we call the commons. So we need essentially to govern a complex entity as a city through what we can call the commons, okay? So, in this case, the commons will not just simply be those small areas shared by a relatively small group of people, but should also be uh, conceived as a center that emerges from the coordination articulation of different kinds of reproduction carried out in different places in different ways. Okay, so that's what is the main Point. Is, I hope this is clear, what we are at now. And so the question for us now is the question of the how, which is, of course, the most difficult question, which I think should be precisely the result of, because it's such a complex question to address, sh precisely we should uh, uh, get more variety 
uh, of, of contribution here, to, to be consistent with, with what we're saying here. But let's say as a contribution to this, let me introduce you the work of Stafford Beer. Stafford Beer is this man here. If you see his, his I unfortunately I didn't put it, but if you see his picture in the 50s and early 60s, he was a very smart and clean man. Okay? He was an engineer. An engineer and, uh, and who became a, a work in various industries as a manager. And then, of course, he was taken <laughs> over by the various uh, revolutions, uh, cultural or not, of the 60s and, and change uh, his, uh, his uh, look, etc. But Stafford Beer uh, is uh, also known for what we call the Bible system model, which we are going to apply try to apply to a city, um, um, but it's interesting to know uh, that in uh, the 70s, he was called by, actually in 72, he was called by um, Allende government in Chile, just one year, one year and a half before the push and, uh, and uh, Pinochet took power. Uh, and why was uh, was uh, called there because Allende was saying, look, I, I'm uh, a president uh, and uh, we want to use democracy to govern uh, our country, but really deep form of, of democracy. And at the time, he, want, he meant by that democratizing the economy and to try to uh, regulate in such a way to prevent crisis and especially uh, prevent crisis that emerge from the environment outside Chile economic environment, but also political crisis that came from the internal opposition from the right wing, which then did the push with, with, uh, with uh, Pinochet. Okay? And what it did, it actually did work uh, with a crowd of people and developed this very futuristic, this is not my idea really, but it developed this very futuristic control system back then, actually most of this stuff is most fake. There are some big, uh, big, big screen uh, with data in there because their idea back then was that if you get data from the various industry very quickly, if you develop this signaling system, you can respond very quickly. And in system theory, if you reduce the lag of response between a stimulus and, and response, you actually reduce the oscillations and therefore the problems that uh, a particular issue may generate. So you have to be quick to respond in order to deal with the problems. Don't mention this to Italian bureaucracy because uh, they still don't grasp uh, the, this basic notion of system theory, but it doesn't, doesn't matter. So uh, the key contribution of, uh, of, uh, of the viable system model is an approach to design a system to fully articulate two aspects. First, the deep autonomy of the parts of the system. That is, you have a system, but each part has to be fully autonomous. Okay? Freedom is based on that autonomy. The highest is the autonomy, the, la the greater is the freedom. Okay? On the other hand, you also want not compromise with the cohesion of the whole. So that was the problem for them. It's like the problem we have today. If you want a complex society, we, but a society which is based on freedom and, and, and autonomy, we want precisely at the same time freedom and autonomy, but at the same time maintain some important degree of cohesion of that of that uh, uh, system, okay? So that was the kind of question he was asking uh, himself, okay? So the point of this viable system model was to develop a system capable of independent existence organized in such a way to be adaptable to the environment and meet the demands of surviving in a changing environment. And if you think about it, that's exactly what is our problem today. If you, organize, if you think through any complex system, a city or anything, an organization, an institution, that's the big problem. The big problem is how do we, well, we may have some changes here and there, but how then we 
respond to the changes coming from the environment, right? And, and we need a system which is viable, okay? So, whenever, if we, it, w w this is model, if we apply to uh, diffuse governance, uh, we have to recognize that in any choice we make, our city is co-evolving with the social and ecological environment to which it relates. And that our form of governance triggers responses to the environment, and the environment triggers responses to the entity we are regulating. And then, of course, we need, uh, we need uh, um, requisite variety. Now, last bit, the model he developed is based on the Matrioska dolls there. Uh, or more formally, what uh, Coaster in Coaster in 67 called holons. And that's a way to think about, very, I think, productive way to think about how we um, uh, how kind of reality is, is organized. If you think about, if you think about uh, system embedded in system embedded in system embedded in system, think about at interacting atoms forms molecules. Interacting molecules form cells which embed then atoms and, and molecules. Interacting cells forms organisms. Interacting organism forms living beings, uh, and interacting living beings form societies. Okay? This is holons, what Corsair call holons. And the way Stafford Bill thought about this complex organization is precisely thinking in terms of holons. Okay, not a hierarchy of power, but a hierarchy of forms, one embedded into another, embedded into another. Each one having its own autonomy and freedom. Okay, and here is the model. Very briefly, I'll try to be. I know that is getting. Late. And let's see, what time is it now? How much do I have? Already exceeded my time? Yes? Good, did I? Okay. <laughs> okay, that's the basic model. Stafford Beer said, okay, that's a viable system. I said, what the hell is that, man? It was so complicated. Well, it's not complicated, actually, if you think about it. They are essentially, in a whole own way, they are essentially five system uh, which which have five functions okay the very basic system one the operations are the very basic is what we do what this organization is for what is it for this or this complex organization we say a city we already define what is our our purpose in the in the city is social and environmental reproduction, reproducing our lives in a socially just way, and in maintenance of good relations, sustainable relations with the environment. That's our purpose. That purpose is carried out right at the bottom, in full autonomy, and each one of let's say the areas, uh, maybe health. Uh, uh, maybe uh, environmental things, maybe educations, whatever. Every area of this, okay, in the system one, has its own self-management, the, the, the square book. So there is complete autonomy there, okay? And you can, I'm not going to do this, you can then even put this at different layers. You can do this in a neighborhood level, district level, or city as a whole level, all integrated in the same way, okay? But here I'm interested in, in highlighting the point. The point is that you have bottom, at the bottom you have most of the decision making and most of the activities which are involved in that objective, which is social reproduction. 
and its own self-management. Okay? Okay, then you have four other systems which have different functions, which, which stuff will be called as meta system or meta management, he calls it, uh, which also can f f follow uh, a, a, the principle of democratic participation. Okay? Uh, and, but the important thing is to understand is that while the bottom system deal with the actual things in hand, I need to help this, uh, we need to sort out how this uh, neighborhood clinic is sorted. Let's pull resources and make decisions in that. Or uh, we need to address the question of education. Or we need to uh, address the question of environmental things or environment in this neighborhood or in this district. And therefore, you have self-management doing that. Okay, And that's what is done. And, and at the level of varieties of most people can pull in, and people includes all, also all experts of different kinds. Okay, it's not that only the people without the expert; the experts are there as well. Okay, at the same time, at this other level, you deal with what he call residual variety. That is, those issues that do not fall within the remit of the operation, the day-to-day -day operation at the, at the bottom. Okay? So, let's uh, very quickly look more in details each of these. So, we are dealing here with the operational level. Here, in the city, what, what, involved, what is involved at that level is reproduction fun uh, uh, functions. The operational domains of the city are commons in terms of different domains of social reproduction, health, education, ecological preservation, and so on. You, we can add whatever element. You think about the different areas of social reproduction which we need to address, and we can think about an organization of how operationally we can deal with in a city. Okay. These functions, of course, are not closed silos, but there is interconnection. And it is interconnection is done, incidentally, also through these other systems, System 2 and System 3 that we are going to discuss. Okay? So there is interconnection between the different things. And of course there is. If you think about the reproduction that I carry, the work of reproduction that I carry at home with my children, some of it is also education, for example. Some of it is also health. Right? These are complex entities. There are uh, mixing things. Okay? And, and as I said, all these operational domains are replicated at different levels. Okay, let's look at then function five, the top. The top. Now, function five is very important, is the purpose. The purpose that we say social reproduction, environmental reproduction. Now, uh, here we can conceive this the overall function system five in different ways, depending on our preferences. But I have my preferences, and I, and I can argue. But if you think about it, in a corporation, this is autocracy. There is a senior management making a decision at, at, at System 5. They tell us what's the purpose. And that, that decision cascades down and pushes everybody to work for that purpose. Okay? In a democratic society, like, for example, in Allende, Chile, Stafford Beer to, uh, uh, Allende asked uh, Stafford Beer, say, well, but what do you put in number 5? Uh, and Stafford Beer said, well, of course, it's you, President. But Allende, to be more democratic than Stafford Beer at the time, I suppose, he said, no, no, it's not me, it's the people. Of course, what he meant was I represent the people. So in democratic society, there is this notion of representation. Okay? That could have limited in terms of requisite variety. In, uh, in period of transition and struggle, there may be a dual power developing. 
like we are today in a sense, although they no, we cannot really talk about dual power today, but there is conflict of, of uh, purposes, okay? Uh, but in, uh, in a fully accomplished democracy, the way I think about it, at the top, number five, we put the assembly. The assembly of all the people, okay? And there are different forms to organize an assembly, okay? So S system five is important for that purpose. Jumped. Okay, system four and system three. System four is intelligence. And I put here the face of Janus, the god, the Roman god. The Roman put this face in front of every door and in front of the gates of every city. It shows a god with two faces, one that looks outside to the environment and one that looks to inside to the how the city was operating, okay? So system four mobilized the collective intelligence necessary to orient the, the, the city in relation to the environment. What is happening over there, right? And how we interact to that. System three is cohesion. System three is over here. System three pursue a balance between cohesion of the whole and, uh, and, uh, and autonomy of the part. Establish a mechanism of uh, resource bargaining between the different parts and at level one. Okay? A mechanism which we can conceive as a democratic mechanism. Okay? But that purpose, again, in system three, there has not to be any particular manager in, in charge, again. We can collectively decide that. There are many examples which if we want to make later, we can make. But resource bargaining is what is, what, what is happening there. And it bridges the criteria for decision making at the operational level, that is at this level, with the highest purposes established at the top. A top, again, which is not a hierarchy of power, okay? Or status, or wages, or income. Okay, so it bridges these, it articulates, okay, what's our purpose in relation to what is actually happening on the ground? It keeps negotiating this. It's like, uh, yeah, uh, 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 um, a way to look at it. So here the Janus, both in system three and system two, is, is, is switched internally. Here was inside, outside, here is top, bottom articulate the two things. And system two, nothing else but provide coordination between different systems at the operational level. For example, timetabling. If we have limited resources in this space and we have many people wanting to use it, we have to provide a timetable and that service is provided by number two, the system two. Okay, so for stuff of beer, now why why are we caring about this? Because for stuff of beer, that's the central idea. These five functions is all that is needed to govern a complex organization. So essentially, is a way to really reduce, well not reduce complexity, but to make it manageable. Okay, uh, once most of the power goes in the first operational level, which is the one which is really has the perp which is really operationalized the purpose of that entity, then the other levels are rarely easy and can all be uh, all, all can be uh, uh, made of people involved in number one. okay none of these, as a necessarily specialized function. Well, it is specialized to a certain degree, but you know, it's it's that's that's the uh, that's the idea. So, and I finish with this uh, slide. Uh, um, uh, there are, of course, uh, no. I've already said this number five, so it's just not. It's just, I don't need that. So I finish with this slide, which is very short, and that is. 
A quote from Gilles Deleuze, desire is production of reality, and I hope that if we desire a different world, uh, we can start thinking about it and making it happen. That's all. Thank you very much, Massimo. Uh, I open the floor for questions. Thanks for an interesting lecture. I was just wondering if it has been tested somehow, actually, this uh, model. Because if you had an enclosed environment or an enclosed system, and you were to, say, have uh, AI or intelligence somehow from a computer, if you could actually try out this model somehow, or if it's been, yeah. Does it make sense if it's been tested? Yeah, of course, of course. You want to know whether <laughs> it works. <laughs> yeah, but also just that it's we're talk if we're talking about the world or a city, it's such big complexity. Yes. But I just wonder yeah. if you sum it down and then you try mm. it out, what kind of results do you okay. get? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you, it, it, it has been uh, tested in, a, in, a, in the first time it's been tested, has been tested uh, in, uh, in, um, in the case of Allende, the year a year and a half before the push, and uh, they what the what this w and and that was already quite complex. Where what what they're trying to to develop there was uh, um, uh, a, a way to uh, regulate the overall national economy and especially public enterprises. Okay, so that's quite complex. And of course, it didn't reach any point, also because of the push. And when Allende, when when Pinochet came, they forgot about biosystem model and, st and started to call the Chicago boys uh, and implement neoliberal policies. Okay, but that's a different issue. But one result of that experience was uh, uh, that uh, um, uh, the. The strike of a section of the transport uh, industry that was organized by the right wing before the, the, the push, okay, before the, the, the Pinochet push, uh, they attempted to uh, weaken uh, Allende government by stopping all the transport workers. Uh, and uh, the uh, the book that I show you tell you the story uh, uh, precisely of how they were able to through this system uh, 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 conception uh, to bypass that particular problem. Now remember, we are talking about disruption within the environment. Okay, so that was uh, an effect. Uh, there is another issue I want to say though, and uh, that in if you look at uh, the world with uh, eyes uh, uh, that try to see how social organizations form, even spontaneously, uh, other times less spontaneously, actually there is a lot in in this model, which um, I mean I'm, I'm sure there are critical elements we can address, etc which actually corresponds to what spontaneously develops on the ground. Okay? I'll, uh, um, let, me, let me briefly uh, show you. Uh, yeah, there it is. That's appendix. I was expecting a question like this, you see? <laughs> <laughs> this is the work of someone has done uh, uh, reflecting on, uh, on uh, the Occupy Wall Street. Now, one, one, uh, this is a different complex reality. It's a movement that, emerge, uh, uh, that emerges, and wha what it does was occupy in a square and maintain it for days, if not weeks. I mean, that was part of the square movements. You can find this in, in, in different areas in the Middle East, uh, in Turkey, at uh, different ways. Okay, in 2011. That was 10, 11. That was the big waves of occupy movements around the world. Now, when you occupy a space for a long time, you are actually not just protesting and then going home. You are building. You need to build organization. You need to provide for food, for medics, for all sort of things. 
okay? You have to deal with the media, you need to deal with the police, you need to do many things, okay? Many things. So it becomes a complex operation. It's far more complex to occupy a square for weeks than marching from A to B in a place. Okay, you have to hold it and to make people live with it and reconcile conflicts and make decisions together, which is exactly the elements which are in Stafford Beer, the model. Well, this is a, 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 a work that has been done, the cybernetic of Occupy, in an article showing precisely how Stafford Beer reflect the type of spontaneous organization of the Occupy Wall Street movement. And, 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 and it's quite remarkable, actually. And if you think about it, Stafford Beer didn't invent this system as out of his imagination or just woke up one, one day like this. But what he did, and that's through his study group in cybernetics of the early 60s, he took this idea from how the nervous system is organized, right? So there is also, uh, uh, and, and, and not just organized, it's self-organized, okay? It's not that there is some little go god inside saying, now you have to operate this neuron, you have to operate this way, you have to, blah, blah. no. It's, it's a series of interconnected complex elements, highly autonomous, who organize itself continuously. Okay, so he got inspiration from that. In fact, I have a little picture there. In fact, I didn't have it in the slide before, but let me show it to you. Uh, I should have it before in this proper version. Let me see. Da -da -dee, da -da -dee. Do I start for beer? Let me show you. Oh, God. Yes, that's it. Oh, that's a small one, though. But yes, that's the one. That's the viable system model in the brain, in the neuron systems, okay? W where different organs uh, play different functions within the overall systems, okay? But none of, it, of, of, of each one is completely in command, and everybody is actually, every element is... Uh, um, is uh okay, there are other cases. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a study I've done before no, even knowing what was stuff we'll be talking about, but then I went back to that, and in fact I said, well, there is, a, there is an element of it, and that is uh, the Water Association in Cochabamba. Again, the assembly in the book, uh, at the top, uh, various working group uh, with different tables dealing with all the different functions that... Uh, that uh, um, uh, stuff for beer is is talking about, and uh, this is another example of food networks in Italy. Uh, it's a network called Genuino Clandestino, in particular in Campi Aperti in Bologna. Some uh, research I've done on that, and again, uh, it can be uh, the the, prac the actual structure which the people are seeking democratic structure reflect more or less what Stafford Beer has conceptualized, okay? So, uh, not to mention, well, this is something I need to work, that's the TL organization, not to mention the, uh, the in amazing example, we were talking about uh, health before, Lena, this is an example uh, of uh, um, this list of companies, which I only highlight badly, Bursuk Healthcare, but all this is a list of companies that this book, La, uh, uh, La, La Lue, uh, wrote in 2014 called Reinventing Organizations, are all based on uh, very bottom-up structures. Okay, both private companies, and in the most incredible cases is the, the case of Birdzok Healthcare in the Netherlands, 
It says there is 7,000 employees when I wrote that, but actually now it's about 12,000 employees. Now, the amazing thing about 12,000 employees, now we're talking about a small town, 12,000 in a very small town, but, you know, good size. 12,000 employees, nurses, who have abolished all, all management, management understood in the traditional sense. Right? That is, people in control of what you're doing and wanting results. They abolish that. And the result of that is, well, it, wh what do you do without, without management? Well, they self-organize. Like the operational level. Divided in different teams. Each team completely autonomous. They set their own budgets. They set their own uh, time to go on holiday. They, they set the way they want to work. And what they've done is actually replacing a lot of uh, public and private care. I mean, they are out, to use this term, they outcompete them in terms of their own uh, ability to address care issues in the neighborhood. They deal with uh, senior people care, old people care. Uh, they uh, have uh, achieved amazing results. And now, now their model is being attempted uh, or exported in Britain and in different places. But they've got rid of management. They're completely self-managed. If they need uh, 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 expertise, they have their own network from which to draw expertise. They have resources to be shared across the network. But in a sense, this is uh, a model of social cooperation, which has nothing to do with hierarchy or with profit motive, but is mostly uniquely based on social reproduction of both the human being who care and of the care for. These are examples. Of course, no one city that I know of has been organized that way, but hey, that's, you're here for that, right? Um, I was wondering if and how um, this theory differs from um, the ideas of Bookchin and municipalism. I wonder if and how this uh, is different from the ideas of a uh, Bookchin and municipalism. Okay. Um, Bookchin is Mary Bookchin is of course. Uh, um, uh, you know, an inspirer of uh, much municipalism. I read Munis uh, Butchkin some time ago, and I told myself I'll go back to to his writing. But for what I remember, uh, I want to go back to his writing and also some of the earlier writing of uh, Council Communism. And back, you know, they say it would be important to trace that tradition and link it up to that, which is something which I have not done, okay? So I'll uh, not comment on that. But what I remember of Butchkin is that his idea uh, of uh, um, municipalism uh, mostly uh, it was like um, um, uh, looking at how municipal power can be organized. Right from neighborhood to right, so it's a, like uh, uh, spatial uh, type of 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 uh, spatially organized. Okay, at the local level and greater level. So in a sense, we can see municipalism as embedded within it. That's my hypothesis, though. I mean, I haven't done the actual real world. You could embed municipalism because. The, the 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 operational level if you think about it the operational level the 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 the, the one that happens here okay it is the operational level it is the meta management is the environment the operational level that can have different very long complex operation if you want the operational level in itself need to be divided spatially. 
you know, one issue is for the neighborhood, and one issue is for the district, one issue for the city as a whole. And in principle, you can escalate even from there, from from region to whatever. Okay, so I think if I may be wrong, I'll have to go back to it. Uh, I think uh, municipalism is an idea that can be embedded within it. But Butchkin didn't deal with this complexity, this issue of variety of complexity or how you deal with, pr because I thought about this system also not as a final utopia. Huh? That I think uh, maybe I'm, I wasn't clear about this, but I, I didn't think about that as a final uto aut uh, utopia. Uh, I think Butchkin maybe saw that, his municipalism in that way. But I saw it precisely because of the relationship between system and environment as a tools for transition. So if you have areas, spaces, locations, cities, in which the balance of forces, because we always have to go back to that, the balance of forces make it possible to reorganize to a certain extent the governance of a, situ of a city or a situation in a different ways, then you, we, we can think in this way, but we will still have to deal with an environment which might be antagonistic, right? Or might send us different feedbacks, so to say, okay? So this is not a final utopia. This is how to build a different reality in the midst of the current reality. That's one other big difference. I have a question on, uh, or I would like to know more about your idea on uh, subjectivity. Uh, earlier in the lecture, you said about this egg and chicken, uh, or you, you framed it in the egg and chicken uh, thing, saying reduction of dependency somehow relates then to new subjectivities. So I was wondering, what is this subjectivity? Is this, let's say, a person constituting itself as a subject, or it, does it relate to your idea on, uh, let's say, composite uh, intelligence? And then, the second question is, where can I find the subject or subjectivities in the, in the final scheme, the, um, ah. the viable um, mm -hmm. system model? Yes. Okay. Is, that a is it located at okay. a certain function or well, in, the the subject meta, in the meta system? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. The, the subject, I'll start from the second question. Thank you. The, the, the subject is, of course, here, 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 here. Here, 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 and here. The subject is everywhere in that sense because the way I conceive this is a profoundly, deeply democratic system. What this overall schema suggests suggest, is a possible overall organization, a very broad organization, but it, it gives us, in a sense, uh, uh, the overall picture of a possible complex organization, but it doesn't tell us the form. If you think about the examples I made, which I say, look, there is a viable system here and there, they are very different. Uh, an Occupy movement is different than a uh, nurse organization. Very different. Yet, the commonality, in the way they are self-organizing, is close to that. that. That's the distinction. Is, does that make sense? Okay. To go back to the egg and chicken, which I just came out, I don't know why I said egg and chicken, but the, the, the idea there was that, uh, you know, when, uh, if you take a subject, uh, and if you think about your life, or I think about my life, if I think about my life, I see that I've been passing through in my life at different intensities uh, in, and participated actively or disruptively, you know, in, the, in a disruptive way depending on the condition, I participated within different systems. That is social relations, okay? If you work in a, 
in a hierarchical company, you fight with managers who want something from you that you say, look, that's either silly or too much work for nothing or whatever, right? There is a conflict, etc. So, or you adapt to it and a lot of things that you don't say because you need the job, you survive. I'm just making this example as, as, as a classical example that happens to us, to a large extent, to all of us. So what I'm saying, my subjectivities developed, develops in relation to system, systems plural. It developed through the system of my family, through the system of my schools, to the system of my friends, various friends networks, to the systems of my, I don't know, political engagement, to the system of my church, when I went to church as a kid, you know, to whatever. You know, our subjectivity is constituted through our ongoing engagement with systems. That's what I'm saying. Okay? And what we, you and I are is the result of it. And we, of course, have had different lives, so we have different mosaics of that subjectivity, different aspects of it. Right? So all I'm saying is that in order uh, th that... If we develop a new system, of course, a system in which the value cooperation, that value collective intelligence, that value conversations, that value solidarity, okay? Those systems, of course, will have an impact on the subject. First of all, we'll have to adapt to these new systems. We'll have to find ways to... to bent our subjectivities in order to be able to uh, deal with all those demands which are different from outside, from other systems. But then that those will also shape us. We don't know what will come up. It's emergent, as everything in complexity tells us. But definitely, if we engage in, in, in new systems like the commons, this will affect and create new subjectivities, which in turn will shape and create new system. So that's the egg and chicken. It's an ongoing relation between those two. It's a co-evolution, in a sense, a co-making. So that means also that is uh, th th there is no point to say, ah, oh, you know, so many. I remember when I was teaching my. Undergraduates, they were my also postgraduates. Sometimes uh, they were told, "Oh, but it's in human nature not to do this, or it's in human nature to be fighting against each other, or it's in human." The call on human nature uh, are calls that uh, prevent us. Uh, well, for, first of all, blind us to the fact that we are actually historically and socially determined. You know. Uh, uh, but blind us and uh, disempower us from the actual possibility of remaking our world. And the question is that uh, we absolutely need and must remake our world. But it's not just imperative because there is no more, you know, because of climate change or we are appalled by social injustice, etc. Because we want a good life and a good life for all. And so there is, shouldn't be any, I think, we might have difficulty from the experience. I mean, lot of in, you know, lot of situations where commoning happens, there are subjects who are not, never accustomed to that and start to be very antagonizing. How, what do you do about that? How do you deal with it? How do you recreate the space? You know, those are a question that the movements ask itself all the time when they create commons at the most local level. There were two more questions. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask about the um, the relationship between the system one of operations and system of purpose that you mentioned. So the constant negotiation between those system systems, even though like in the model they are kind of far from each other. Yeah, uh, and. Yeah, since especially in relation <laughs> to yeah, yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, especially in relation to the fact that you mentioned in the beginning that you um, believe this model can be applied to like both small scale and larger scale, like realistic scenarios. So I'm wondering because I feel like a lot of uh, what what was inspired by by Marx and Engels, uh, like in practice, the the whole relationship and cooperation between system of operation and system of purpose was precisely what did not work. So I'm wondering if oh. in your research. Ah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, okay, that's uh, okay. There has definitely been uh, a very hierarchical and um, and um, uh, tradition within Marxist Marxism, uh, but. Uh, I I would uh, I would say that in reading Marx, uh, things are really left in a very broad sense that you can read anything. Uh, for me, this is not. I mean, this is a way to conceive the, or maybe a way to conceive what he called the association of free producers. Marx talked about. The association of free producers. Well, how do the free producers organize themselves? Well, different ways, etc. But those five functions has to be there. That's what cybernetic tell us. Okay, and we might think about well, they forgot this function, or they maybe this is, no. Those functions need to be there. However, they a particular situation organize them. Whether they, for example, put together two and three, or or two and three and one, I don't know, but those five functions have to be there in a certain way. So, for me, that is highly democratic. Remember that at the top, what, what I would see is at the top is the assembly. Now, how to organize an assembly of one million people? That's, that's the question. I don't have an answer, but uh, Athens 2,000 and what, 500 years ago, had a population of free citizens of about what, 10,000? How many? 40,000. 40, the, the actual free citizens. Now, the, the free, I say free citizen because those are the, were the ones who actually took the decision. Women and slaves did not. Okay, so we have to <laughs> maintain. But, you know, back then, back then, back then, before internet, mobile phone, cars, and uh, television, whatever, they were able to or self organize a city of, let's say, 12,000 citizens who actually self -de -de decided for themselves. And they developed the, one of the greatest cultures in Europe uh, back then. Uh, and uh, and they uh, and they uh, judges were sorted by lots and uh, and governors go governments were sorted by lot oh lottery oh that's one way to deal with some of these function lotteries every cook can govern I'm I'm just saying this I'm not saying this is what need to be done I'm saying if we put our collective intelligence together between old um, old uh, solutions to uh, uh, so some of the decision can be made through uh, quick uh, uh, referendums like the tech is tell us that we should do every decision. I don't think every decision should be taken like this, but some of the decision can be taken through electronic means. Depends on what is priority and what is not priority. You know, We can think about this, but the techniques today available, if we pull together our collective intelligence, are immense in relation to the ancient Greece. So, uh, it's an open question what we, what we can do. Uh, but it's worthwhile that we start thinking about it. That's all. Does it make sense?
my question is about agency. Because your proposal, of course, needs systemic changes. Uh, and all, let's say, purposes in, in, in the history of humankind of, uh, let's say, self-government or more self-government needed to have a consciousness about antagonism. Uh, and so my question is double. Uh, why the city as a commons? Why is the title not the country as a commons, the neighborhood as a commons, the family as a commons? So why do you use the city? I mean, I'm, I'm very, let's say, <laughs> supportive of this, but I think we need an argument. Why the city? Uh, why that scale? And then the second question related to that, what are the antagonisms that your, the proposed systemic scales are going to encounter? Because of course it's, I hope, it's not a question of just convincing through conferences that this is a good idea and then going home and saying from tomorrow onwards, we are going to apply this. So there is some kind of, I don't know, I mean, Marx thought about class struggle, uh, book did, uh, at, at other, but you need a social basis. And so why citizens are the best place to have to commoning and not uh, nationals or international, I don't know, or family members? So what, what kind of social basis do you propose and what are the antagonisms you figure out? Now, thanks for the question. That allows me to clarify, really, okay, the, the choice of the city when, it became, when I started to work on this was to think about a complex enough entity that would make uh, that my reasoning focused on that complexity, okay? But of course, neighborhood, uh, nations, the world as a commons. I mean, I, I, any scales, I'm up for it. There's no problem. The choice of a city was because of the size, people, well, part of it, there is a m big interest in cities, and so people thinking about oh, city as a commons, how, you know, what would that mean? And, and it's a degree of complexity, which is, goes back also to the literature of municipalism and et cetera, where people think, how do we go this is where we live? How do we govern in a different ways? But yes, you mentioned the country as, a, as a, the countryside. I mean, for one, one, if we were going down to actually think about this more concretely, uh, as the cities, as cities, uh, as I mentioned before in a conversation with Snow, they, 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 uh, every city, to make a generalization, maybe it's not like that, but it's very close to that, uh, imports 100% of, of food and materials and exports 100% of its rubbish, more or less. Right? So we cannot talk about cities without at the same time talking about a quote, country, however, it's the local around surrounding the cities or some other parts of the world that is the receiving end of that rubbish. Okay? So, yes, that in a, a, a more engaged um, preoccupations around that city should always look as part of the environment as, as, as focus the preoccupations of the city. Um, uh, but uh, personally, I, uh, I I also chose the city because uh, when uh, uh, when uh, I s I really s uh, it's a while I'm thinking about this, but the opportunity for me to actually think about it and write something about it was an invitation from uh, uh, the editors of this um, uh, book uh, on post-growth that were asking me to talk about governance. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, that book, Governance uh, and the Cities, are, you know, is, is a good complex entity linked to it. So that's why. So what I'm saying, this is an initial work that I'm doing. doing. It's trying to, I have to develop far more than that. We have to develop, hopefully, not just me, because this is. Yes, but you, you tend to answer at the systemic level again. Eh? 
waste management, uh, uh, food production, etc. But the agency question, what oh, about... The what I arrive in the agency, yes, okay. yes. Yeah, yeah, what, yeah. what about the argument that the city is the only place where in proximity there is enough variety? I mean, Marx's argument to think that the, uh, the modern industry uh, would be the place of human emancipation. No, no, that's not is, my argument. No, that, but I don't want to make no. a parallel to that no. argument. I'm not. I'm not trying to uh, highlight a privileged side for social emancipation. Okay. Okay. Absolutely not. Uh, that's not my uh, aim or 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 desire. In fact, uh, personally, I think that cities should be far more ruralized, while the rural should be much more urbanized, but in a good sense, in terms of services, in terms of culture, in terms of a you know, variety of aspects. Uh, so th that's not a privileged side, absolutely. There are uh, important, crucial, fundamental struggles that don't come from the cities, that comes from areas. Uh, uh, where are far from city, or uh, like the ex I mean, just comes an example, the example of Cochabamba water associations that uh, was at the basis of the rev water revolt in 2001 in Bolivia. Those were people coming from subject subjectivities from the countryside, coming in the city, not having water, and digging their own wells, and as as farmers and peasants do because they have developed that subjectivity, say, well, there is a problem, we solve it. You know, the, the direct democracy, <laughs> incidentally, it's, I mean, I can see that, I could see it in my own grandparents, the history of the territory where I live in, uh, in, in I live in Modena, uh, uh, in the Apennines, I can see that in the indigenous struggles. The subjectivities of those people who are rooted in the countryside, they have a problem, they come together and try to solve it. It's very much the commons there in, in, in instinct rather than delegation or waiting for someone else solving their own ways. So, no, I'm, I'm uh, definitely it's not a privileged side, uh, side, 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 yeah, uh, side. Um, uh, but uh, as I mentioned before, in, in relation to the agency, and of course, here I presuppose that there is an agency. So um, this is not the model that I would uh, go to a bunch of um, uh, uh, politicians who say, "Look, look at what a nice, wonderful model. Why don't you apply?" <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. It's a, it won't work. Well, it won't work. It won't work because you need the subjectivity. You actually, say reclaiming. We want to find a way to reclaim it. Let's sort it out. If you don't have that, if you don't have a social movement from below, which is both for commons and 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 and, and creating commons, which are spaces of self-organization, but also want to change the reality that is a social movement that is a commons that look beyond their own little thing, right? But they want to really change the entire fabric of society. Uh, then you have... That, so an assumption of this model is that there is such a movement and that there is such a subjectivity. Okay, that's, that's for me absolutely clear. There is no question about it. Thank you very much. I think we'll wrap it up here. Thank you very much, Thank Professor you. De Angelis. Give him a round of applause. I can have a beer now. Yes, you can. And as it happens, uh, next year we will leave it off uh, here with thinking about how to transition the, uh, the city towards a more, you could say, just and environmentally just uh, society. Uh, we're going to talk about urban sustainability transitions in the next series of Stad Salons in the next academic year. So I hope you can all attend then as well. Thank you.